already in 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 his career uh, by the way please note that we're recording this uh, talk uh, so if you don't want to 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 be seen you 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 can close your your camera um, so the professor professor Idreos has a long list of achievements in 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 his career and uh, these uh, include uh, the 2011 ACM Sigma uh, Jim Gray Award for his uh, 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 doctoral thesis, the 2011 Ersim uh, Corbayan uh, Award uh, for his thesis uh, as well, and he has also been awarded the 2015 uh, uh, IEEE uh, TCD Rising Star Award, uh, the IEEE Technical Committee on data uh, uh, engineering for his work on uh, uh, data adaptive systems and he has uh, received the 2022 ACM Sigma test of time award for uh, some of his work uh, uh, on uh, NoDB and uh, he's a recipient of the National Science, Science Foundation career award the Department of Energy Early Career uh, uh, award uh, among others so he's uh, uh, a very achieved uh, researcher and uh, he's going to talk to us about his uh, some of his latest uh, work on uh, self-designing systems that can help us in uh, building uh, AI pipelines. So we're very excited uh, Strato, to have you here uh, with us and the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Femi. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thanks everybody for joining. Um, so this is going to be, um, my understanding is that the, the audience is, is quite broad. So uh, I see some, some database friends also there. Uh, so please, if, if this is too high level, ask me, ask me uh, questions, uh, detailed questions, or if this is too detailed, ask me high level questions, anything you want. Uh, so what I, what I will try to do is uh, uh, I'll try to walk you through uh, why data systems are, are quite critical for, uh, for what is coming and um, how we try to think about the problem of data system design um, and, and the overall motivation of, of why and how we can uh, build new systems in the future that can kind of keep, keep with the pace of, uh, of developing new applications, new exciting applications. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is what we all did in our, in our database class the first day. Um, data systems are wonderful. Um, data systems help us uh, store data and help uh, provide access to data. And, and I'm using the term data systems uh, very, very broadly. Uh, effectively, anything that can store data, anything that can provide access to data uh, without uh, really limiting in any way the kinds of algorithms, the kinds of analysis you want to do over your data. So the, the beautiful thing here, if you, if, if you build a data system the right way, is that you provide the layer of abstraction um, so that you can effectively uh, say, "Here is my data," and then and then in the future say, you know, "Bring me data with with a particular property." And and once you can do that, once you can have this kind of abstraction, then you can go and build all sorts of applications. And and this is what has happened with definitely with relational databases, but also this is what has to keep happening to sustain the uh, the evolution that we want to see. Uh, with with big data applications, and so you all know about the uh, how the world is evolving and, and the different things that we are creating, um, regardless of the buzzwords that we use around around these words. Um, but one way or the other, data systems, uh, in the broad sense of data systems, they they have to be in the center of that because they are the the way in how we're managing data. So let's see some of those applications and how they relate to data systems. And then we will go through why um, why data systems are so critical in order to be able to build those applications. Um, so this is the the let's say the old typical thing that we would think about. Uh, so, for example, let's pick up our bank account. Uh, how do we put money in our bank account, and that is reflected? How do we move money around? Uh, so somehow there has to be a record for this, and and somehow this has to be consistent. Um, but then there's there's other aspects that are kind of meta-analysis of what is happening there. Um, and that's what we call analytics typically. So for example, you might be looking for certain statistics uh, around how this system is being used uh, by, by users. And that gives insights on maybe what kind of products you wanna create. Um, and then there's 
other interesting things that are starting to happen. So for example, um, someone is swiping their credit card, uh, you know, they're, they're traveling from, from, from Boston to Paris, and then I'm swiping my credit card uh, in, a, in a grocery store there. Um, well, we have to decide very quickly if this is a legal transaction or not. So it's not only about reflecting that transaction to my bank account and to the grocery store's bank account. It's also deciding on the spot whether this is a legal transaction in the first place. Um, and that's a different kind of question, but but it's a question that involves a lot of data management uh, in order to be able to do it right and, and to do it quickly. Um, and then let's go and, and think about more, even more modern applications, let's say. So, so let's pick social networks. Um, Here's, here's a question there. Uh, so let's let's say pick uh, an application where people are writing reviews about restaurants or about uh, hotels. Um, so again, you can do analytics there by collecting all this data, uh, but you can also do things such as that look like the bank uh, application, uh, but it's, an, it's just on a different context. So for example, someone is posting uh, a Yelp review. Um, is that a legitimate person? Is that a legitimate review in terms of the text? Should we show this to other to other users? Um, so again, there's the there's the concept of you know we want this data stored, we want this data to be accessed and analyzed in the future, but also we want to know if this is if this data is actually real. Uh, what is the intention of this data? And we want to make a quick decision whether that actually enters the system where this is seen by other users. Um, same thing uh, that might not be entirely obvious to everybody immediately that this is again something that happens with data um, you know, you're you're trying to catch a ride uh, with uber uh, the price fluctuates the, the price is actually be being computed on the fly uh, with data uh, based on an analysis that is happening right there on the spot so it's not a fixed price it's something that it is an artifact that is being created from uh, from data and from algorithms uh, on the, in the background Okay, so now we can go back to this, this interesting question. So why, why are our data systems so important here? Um, so, so the first thing is uh, that they provide effectively the abstraction that we need so we can actually think about these applications uh, in a way that doesn't involve thinking about computation, thinking about speed and scale. Uh, so we can think only about the properties of the application. So the statistical properties, for example, of the analytics that we're doing or the kinds of things we wanna predict. Um, so that's that's the first part. And then the second part, uh, there's no better way to explain it than, than the wonderful analogy by, by, by Jim Gray. Um, and it, it, it basically goes back to hardware. Um, and the thing is that the way the way hardware works, uh, data movement is is really, really, really so expensive that uh, ends up uh, being the overwhelming cost of everything that we do. Um, and so, Jim Gray used to say that uh, when an algorithm is looking for data uh, on, on the registers, so very close to the computational units of, of hardware, it's as if a human being is looking for something that is in, in the very same room. Um, but then as you go down what we call the memory hierarchy, uh, it, it gets slower and slower. And, and the analogy here is showing you that if your algorithm is looking for something that is on disk, it, it's as if you really have to go to a different planet. Uh, and that gives you a kind of a very good ballpark anal uh, analogy for uh, how expensive it is to um, effectively not take data, data movement, data location into account when you're building anything. Um, and so you need to have this, this computational and data movement knowledge uh, every time you design anything. And of course, we can't expect uh, developers and applications uh, to have that knowledge. And that's why that creating that abstraction with data systems is so critical if we want our applications to actually be viable. Um, and so today, if we go and see and analyze any kind of, any kind of algorithm uh, across all these applications, regardless of exactly what this algorithm is doing, um, modular really rare ex exceptions, we'll find that data movement is the most critical part of the of the end-to-end -end cost. And so by the end-to-end -end cost, what I mean here is, is really being able to complete that particular data analysis or data prediction. Um, and if we look at the hardware, on the hardware side, so how do we utilize the hardware, the computational hardware? 
uh, we'll find that the numbers are typically in the order of 30 to 50 percent and this is getting worse over time um, and so for example in the uh, in, in the database world we know about the uh, we know quite well about how hard it is to um, paralyze and utilize multicores that's something that lots of bright people are trying to work over the last a couple of decades and still we can't confidently say that we have uh, systems that can do that super super well um, and when we move to the, the more recent things that are happening the uh, the computational algorithms in the in the AI space this is this is even harder and the in the hardware there that which is typically GPUs it's even more parallel and so getting getting to that goal of utilizing that hardware uh, in the right way, it gets even more even more challenging, and and it's a moving target because that hardware is changing uh, really rapidly every every few years. Okay, so with that, I think that brings me to this conclusion, which again I, I'll use someone else's words to 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 say it because uh, they they uh, they make perfect sense. So uh, that uh, the fact that effectively data systems are the plumbing of the modern world, uh, and that is just going to keep. Uh, happening, keep being true. Um, so that, that's that's what Volker Markle, how Volker Markle is describing the uh, the situation with data systems in our applications today. So if data systems don't work, we can't really we can't really build anything uh, in in the future. Okay. So so what is the what is the problem here? So what are we trying to think through? Um, so the problem is that uh, the world around us is changing very fast, and we want it to change very fast. Um, and so the context where data systems are supposed to run uh, is, is changing effectively very, very fast. And so what is the context? The context is hardware and applications. Um, so hardware is you know, where our applications are going to be uh, executed um, and, and data systems have to work well with that hardware if you want good performance. And applications is effectively the data and the kinds of analysis we wanna do over the data. Um, and, and you all know that this is all of that is, is moving is moving very fast and we're all very excited to see these applications uh, hopefully affect our lives in a, in a, in a positive way um, so so what happens is that there's a continuous need to have new data systems um, that will be able to support these new applications um, but on the flip side it is actually extremely hard to design and build new data systems so now we have this this kind of tension here. And that's exactly the problem that that we're trying to think through uh, and ask effectively the question: How can we how can we end up with good and appropriate data systems uh, very very fast for this for these new kinds of applications? Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean to have a you know a, a good a good data system for an application? So typically, when we when we design systems, um, we think about the first time the first thing we think about is performance. So uh, how can we design the, you know, the, the, the fastest possible system for this particular application, meaning, meaning for this particular data, for this particular kinds of analysis we're gonna do, um, and, and for the available hardware. Uh, these days, the question is slightly different. Um, so slightly more complex because everything effectively runs on the cloud. And so there's, there's also a balance between performance and cloud cost and, and those two things they, they, they don't have a linear relationship um, both in terms of the application requirements and in terms of what happens in the end in terms of performance and so that's that's another element here that comes into the picture so so it might be that you want a particular balance of of speed and cloud cost that, that you're looking for and not just speed um, and then and then there's a series of questions that are um, at the first glance, they might not look so scientific, let's say, but they're extremely hard to answer, and and they become they become a real bottleneck as we think about the the lifetime of of a data system uh, serving a particular application, um, and that being an application, a modern application that is evolving very rapidly uh, uh, compared to our past applications. Um, and so, what I mean here is is Again, if we think about our prototypical kind of heavy data systems application of the past, um, you know, just maybe uh, our, uh, something that has to do with the banking sector, um, what you do with that doesn't really change every every few months. It, you know, it, it offers certain specific functionalities, and it is what it is. 
Uh, but if you think about a new and exciting business on the web, a new kind of social network, a new kind of AI startup, um, well, they're going to be introducing new features really, really rapidly for their applications. And those features are going to be translating to different kinds of data, different kinds of analysis they're going to be doing. And so different kinds of ways that they're stressing um, their underlying data systems. Uh, and they will depend on the data systems being uh, kind of behaving in, in, the, in the right way in terms of performance and costs and all of that. Um, and so that continuous evolution creates, creates a pressure that makes questions like this here uh, extremely hard to answer and extremely and extremely important. Okay, so so going back to going back to the problem here, the problem is that one way or the other, this leaves us with many times this leaves us with suboptimal data systems, and and suboptimal data systems effectively on the cloud, uh, especially on the cloud, they can mean uh, large cloud costs and the associated environmental impact. Um, it also means that. If an application actually has a transition between different data systems, one way or the other, that is both an expensive and a dangerous transition to do. Um, and as we tried to touch just, just briefly before, um, many, many very often it's just not possible to achieve a specific feature uh, because it will be um, it will be near near impossible to compute it. Uh, a funny personal story I have is that I was working for a for a for an AI startup. Uh, a couple of years ago, and, and basically they called me and said, we're, we're trying to create this 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 data features for our model, and it takes seventy five it will take seventy five years to train that model. Uh, can we do something about it? Because otherwise, the, the, the feature we wanna the feature we wanna compute is not possible, and so the whole the whole uh, idea of creating that model becomes impossible. Um, and so there is this very interesting very interesting um, feasibility aspects that you get. If you don't have the right data systems under the hood, um, so okay, so that brings us to the root of the problem that we're trying to address here, and that is the complexity of of building data systems. Um, this is this is a really really complex problem by itself, and and uh, and many of the friends in this call know this really really well. Uh, so this is what what is the process of of building data systems kind of for the last several decades. Um, it's it's basically uh, you could characterize it as ad hoc, meaning that um, there's no there's no beginning and end necessarily. Uh, it's it's effectively a set of very smart people trying to solve a very very hard problem, uh, and then at some point you stop because you have to ship that system or that feature of that system. Um, there's no there's no there's no way to even know in most cases that you have the best possible design. So so that's that's the best way to describe data systems design is that it is it is effectively kind of an art it's it's this wonderful thing uh that is really fun to do it's really complex to do um but it's also it has this this ad hoc nature that is kind of a bridge between science and art um so what does it mean it means that it's it's effectively uh for the people that do it it's very fun but for the people who are waiting for the systems uh it's it's very slow and it is very expensive Here's some numbers about how long it takes to build a data system. So I think a few years ago, people would say it takes about 10 years. Um, these days, you would probably say six to seven years um, because we have lots of, because of the cloud and lots of modern tooling, uh, everything is slightly faster. Um, but when it comes to actually reasoning about data systems, so, so reasoning about what would happen if we change our system like this or like that? What would happen if we uh, use this new hardware? Uh, very often, this would be um, extremely time-consuming questions to answer, um, or it might even be uh, impossible to answer these questions. So, so this is not effectively this is not a, a situation that is sustainable long term. Uh, if we want to be able to keep up with the pace of the kinds of applications we want to create in the future, uh, as our collection of data and, and our hardware keeps changing, um, so so here's here's now how how we are trying to think about this problem. So we're trying to think about this problem in a way that shifts uh, moves away from the uh, manual design of every individual system, and instead starts looking at this problem. In a, in a way that that is that is a little bit more systematic with respect to how we explore 
the, the possible designs. And so the theory here is that there's a, there's a massive space of what is possible in terms of system design. What we have, uh, what, what, we, what we see there, every dot that we see there in this space is, is effectively one possible design. And that is interpreted as, as a set of low level design decisions that uniquely characterize that particular system. And then if we look and try to associate what has happened in research and in industry over the last several years across classes of system designs, we'll find that um, that actually covers a very, very small part of, of what is possible. Um, and even, and even, even with many systems actually having what we call tuning knobs, uh, where we change their behavior slightly, those knobs that don't really fundamentally make a difference with respect to the to the overall design space. Um, so what we want to do is to be able to look at that, understand it, and then every time we want to design a new system because we have a particular new uh, goal, so new kinds of data, new kinds of analysis we want to do, new kinds of hardware, we want to be able to look at that and just point to the to the to the to the slot there that is actually the perfect data system that we should use uh, for the existing uh, for the existing context that we have right now. So instead of picking from um, from the ones that are available or instead of setting and spending another six or seven years to designing a new one, can we can we associate requirements uh, with a design from what we uh, from a, from a massive design space of what we think is possible? So that's the goal and and that leads us to the um, that notion of reasoning here. So we should be able to reason about this design space, meaning we should be able to understand what are the fundamental design decisions, the primitive design decisions that that actually construct help us construct that massive design space, um, how they combine with each other, uh, what is their impact in terms of every time we add or change one of the design decisions, how does the performance of of the resulting uh, system changes in, in depending on the data and the hardware and so on and so on. And once we can do that, now we can start thinking about designing algorithms that can search over this massive space. And that's that's effectively that's effectively our our methodology and uh, and what we're trying to do. Um, how do we start here? Um, because obviously, as we as we know, there's so many different aspects uh, that that come when when you have to think about the data system and i'm just showing some some small of those some small part of those aspects that have to do with uh with the traditional for the traditional notion of systems um but the answer actually of how do we start is simple when we go back and and think about the jim gray slide um because it, it effectively it all starts from from how we store data and then everything everything else kind of piles up uh algorithmically uh, on top of on top of these decisions um so uh, here's a here's an example. Again, hopefully, for uh, also non-computer scientists can understand. Uh, let's say we have some set of numbers here, um, and we're looking for for one particular number. And that again can be it's 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 the most primitive kind of operations that all kinds of data systems do across all applications. So if we want to do this this simple operation. Um, the only way to do it in this case, based on this data organization here, is to just go and, and look at all the data. There's no way around this. Um, so regardless if this is, uh, you know, kind of uh, a set of weights in a neural network training process or, or uh, a column in a column store database or, uh, or an array in a NoSQL database, it doesn't matter. If, if you want to do this primitive operation, in this case, you do have to search over all this, over, over all this data, and as this data gets gets bigger and bigger, now this operation is going to go. It's going to get slower and slower. And so, if we try to think about, can we be smarter somehow and think about a better algorithm? The answer is, um, well, we we can't do anything unless we start thinking about this problem from from scratch and think about how we store the data. And unless we change how we store the data, unless we change the data organization, there's no way to think about a better algorithm effectively here. Uh, that that will really make a difference, and so if we go kind of here's another extreme just for simplicity. In this case, we 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 sorted the data, we ordered the data completely. Um, now we can 
actually do use a different algorithm. We do have the opportunity to think about potentially using a different algorithm. Um, and so we can use some kind of sorted search here. Uh, and now we have the, of course, we have to think about the whole context of and the trade-off of, of uh, you know, how long does it take to, to organize the data in that way, how, how expensive it is to maintain the data in that way, and so on and so on. But now we start having decisions that we can do and, and associate them with our application. Um, and so the whole point here, again, is that data organization is, is really critical. So even, even if often we, we would just say simply that it's all about algorithms, um, it is, but algorithms themselves to start with, with thinking about how we organize data. That's, that's how we start designing a new algorithm. Okay, so life could be great if there was a perfect data structure because then we would just use that data structure and, and build our perfect data systems and we'll be done. Um, but there's no, there's no perfect data structure um, because data structures themselves, they have their own internal uh, design space. And, uh, and that design space is itself massive and complex uh, and full of trade-offs. So three trade-offs that people typically talk about in this space, um, read, update, and memory amplification. So the fact that you can't really get perfect uh, across, across all of them. So um, these are, these are, what these trade-offs are are, uh, are are easy to think about uh, as follows. So for example, read amplification would mean how much, how much more data do I have to read on top of the data that I want to read. So if I'm looking in the previous example, if I'm looking for just one data item in, in a massive data collection, um, life would be perfect if somehow the system can read only that one data item. And, and that's the only thing that it moves around and it gives it to me. Um, but because of data organization, because of hardware properties, the system might end up reading actually hundreds of data items just to give me this, this one item. And so all these extra items that it reads, we call it read amplification. Uh, and so one way or the other, we end up having this, this trade-off here where every data structure will be effectively uh, a compromise among, among these trade-offs. And, um, and effectively, you know, these days we would say that a great data structure is one that really captures the, the properties of these applications correctly so that you can do those compromises in, in the right way and, and effectively optimize for the, for the trade of that that's the most important for the current application. And so we end up having class of data structures uh, that behave well with respect to particular trade-offs. Um, and the problem is even more complex, as many of you on the call know, because it's not just read, update, and memory amplification. These, these trade-offs, they do break up in, in, in more. So read amplification would be you know, point reads and range reads. Uh, and again, those are really fundamental operations that appear across any kind of application uh, you, you might think about. Um, and it keeps, it keeps going. There's more and more. For example, update is, is, uh, is not just update, but also inserts and deletes. Um, and so all those things together, they form the complexity of, of building, building new algorithms. And when it comes to data systems, uh, what data systems really are, the data systems are, are effectively collections of data structure and algorithms trying to work together to achieve specific goals. Um, so let me, let me walk you again briefly through uh, what NoSQL key value stores are. Um, using this notion of, of data structures uh, uh, working, data structures and algorithms working together. Um, so NoSQL key value stores is this wonderful class of, of data systems that has been like a very active area, both in industry and in research the last, the last couple of decades. Um, and you'll find them everywhere. So, you know, when you read your email, when, when you go to social networks, um, when, when you see how the, the number of likes are counted in, in, your, in your Facebook stream, um, when you store weights during forward and backward propagation in, in, uh, in, in neural network training, um, in SQL systems, the catalog is built as a, as a NoSQL system, and so on and so on and so on. The, 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 uh, the system that supports all, all kinds of crypto uh, in blockchain and other and other protocols is a, is a NoSQL key value store. Uh, so this is really a, a, a big substrate of of many many things that that, that we are doing. Uh, and again, it's nothing more than than a than a collection of data structure algorithms trying to work together um, to achieve specific operations. And so, in in the NoSQL key value store, you will you will have this notion of a buffer that gets data in memory. 
and collects this data in memory and slowly propagates that data on what we call multiple different levels on disk. And so every, every level and the buffer itself is a, is a different data structure. Um, so it's an orthogonal, it's a, it's a different component of the system, it's a different data structure where we store different parts of the data that have different properties. So, and, and in this case, the properties happen to be, happens to be a time property. So the most recent data would be on the buffer, the next most recent data would be on, on level zero, the next most recent data would be on level one and, and, and so on and so on and so on. And then there's a, there's a series of other data structures. For example, there's a data structure that we call uh, filters. Um, typically, you would have Bloom filters there uh, that help us avoid accessing data uh, to disk when we know probabilistically we kind of expect that what we're looking for doesn't exist on any of the levels on disk. And so now we can skip going back to the mem uh, going down the memory hierarchy because remember how, how expensive it, it, it is. This is. Um, fences will help us access just one page from, from disk. So if the filters say what you're looking for exists uh, in, in level two, uh, so it's worth going and doing that disk access, fences, the fence pointers can help us uh, access just one, one page on disk. And so they, they drastically limit how much data we're, we're moving around as well. So everything, everything is centered around that. And there's, there's multiple different data structures that help us with that. And then, and then there's a CAS effectively data structure that does what you would expect the CAS uh, does. It, it effectively just remembers uh, previous operations. And so you can you can find this data more quickly. So, so again, what we see here, we see uh, uh, a, rather, a rather complex set of operations and data structures that have to work together. Um, they are diverse data structures in that they're not all doing the same thing. Um, they have to work together for every for every individual action we want to do over this data. Uh, we have to invoke multiple of these data structures, uh, so they, they have to work together. Uh, they have to work nicely with hardware so that they can get good performance. Um, and then all sorts of properties that are very critical, such as parallelism, in the sense that uh, you know if you look at these applications above, uh, you don't expect to be able to do one operation over your data system at a time, but but really more like tens of thousands uh, per second. Um, and then it's not just about pure performance in terms of speed, but other critical um, properties of data systems should be true, such as robustness and cloud cost and, and, and cloud escalation and so on and so on and so on. Okay, so, so in such a context, what, what we are doing is that we're trying to think through, well, okay, if there's no, if there's no single perfect, in this case, for example, no SQL key value store that can, um, be the right one for every application. How do we? What is the process here to create always the perfect one? Um, and so we would need to know what we end up with is is a is a system that takes as input the data and queries of, of an application, the performance requirements of the application, and the, the available budget of this application. And then it can also take as input optionally things such as uh, what cloud provider you want to use, what hardware, and so on and so on. But this is not necessary. All of that goes through this black box system, and what you get as output is the exact system design, the the code, and then if you haven't provided the cloud provider and the VMs, you actually get the cloud provider and the VMs that you should use to actually achieve um, the performance requirements and the cloud cost requirements given given the input query. So you actually get the whole system design and the code for for that system. Um, the most powerful thing here is that. Once you have this process, you what you get is that you can do what if reasoning, and uh, and that's that's really powerful because it goes beyond just designing a system just once. Um, so what happens here is that you could repeat this process multiple times and start comparing the inputs and the outputs. And as long as you change one thing at a time, this comparison start being meaningful. So for example, maybe you go once to this process, um, and then we go a second time. Uh, and we just change the budget. So effectively, what this says is that, um, for example, okay, I have a system, um, it's working for my application, but what happens if I reduce the budget that I'm spending on the cloud by, you know, X thousands of, of, of euros per month? And that then this process can actually compute for you uh, because it will give you a new, a new data system design that would be optimal for this cloud budget given your workload. Uh, and, and so you will know that 
okay, the, this is the performance that we'll get from this new system. How does this compare with my previous optimal system? With, because this was optimal for a, for a higher cloud budget. And now you know whether you want to reduce the amount of money that you spent or not, because that might have a, a critical impact in your application. Um, so it's not about just going through this process once and getting into the system, but also being able to reason about that across across different levels of the of the application. Um, okay, so I guess you 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 all got that we're talking about automatically designing here, and, and automatic design is is not a new thing in in computer science. So computer science was actually created for automatic design in the first place. Um, as as I'm trying to read more and more in kind of the origins of computer science. There's more. There's really wonderful reads about automation. Um, a very nice hint about specifically about data structures and automation uh, is is in a paper by Rob Trazan where there was a paragraph in the end where he was arguing that we need the calculus for data structures, and I think that's that's really beautifully put right there. Um, and and so one way, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to think about the calculus about whole data systems in respective of the of the application that you have on top okay and so what i'm going to show you next is is one slide that um that effectively gives you the whole the whole technology behind how we're trying to create this in with with an analogy um and it's an analogy that comes from maybe from real life in in some sense so um so here's here's the sequence of of words. So these are words that 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 we all know, we all use, we all will know what they mean very very well. Um, and so they are effectively known entities, known primitives, let's say. Um, but then if we take some of them, we we'll put them in some particular order. Effectively, we get something new and interesting from from things that that we actually knew already. Um, and so there's some there's some creation here. We 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 just we just discovered something uh, that is super interesting, and and all of that came from from known entities. Um, and so that's a very interesting aspect of 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 the language here. So we started from an alphabet, uh, we created words, and then and then with grammar we created valid sentences. And then with the the particular creativity of of Nikos Kazantzakis in this case, we we can create effectively anything we want. Um, and, and it's so interesting that in some sense this was always there. This was part of the design space, but it's not that you know uh, uh, all of us can just start creating such beautiful sentences right right there. there there's a certain element of, of creativity here and and, and beauty in, in, in how someone thinks. Uh, so um, this is this is effectively the same thing of what we're trying to do. Can we accelerate this process somehow for the development of data systems? So if we knew somehow the alphabet, and that would be the design principles. Uh, if we, then we can create the, the fundamental elements of data systems, starting from data structures, and then uh, starting to create a grammar that defines how these data structures uh, and their algorithms interact with each other to create bigger entities, which would be data systems. In the same way that that you know this this sentence here feels like it's something new out of things that we we knew already. Um, it's as if we're asking here, uh, you know. What are all possible data structures and data systems we may ever invent with this particular uh, alphabet? Okay, so I hope I hope this made some sense and kind of um, uh, unified a little bit the, the concepts of the design space and exploration and, uh, and creativity and how you can create uh, what is what is our process in terms of figuring out the alphabet, figuring out the grammar, how things connect, um, and so in the end that that. And that leads to uh, a methodology that is all about creating those design spaces from, from these alphabets and the combinations of the possible combinations of those alphabets. And then having a secondary thrust where we're going and searching over that mass, massive design space. So searching for combinations of, of, uh, of primitives that uh, are valid and they can have good properties for a particular problem we're trying to address. Um, so I'll, I'll show you this slide and then I'll, I'll switch to show you this last part on, on image processing. Um, so these are, these are some of our works that use this methodology across uh, data structures, NoSQL systems, um, statistics, and neural networks. Um, 
what I want to do is, um, and then you, you, you'll find you'll find kind of promising results there. For example, there's the, in this paper on self-designing systems, you'll see that we can actually create no SQL systems that are three orders of magnitude faster compared to the fastest systems by um, that, that you will find today in industry by creating systems that are really tailored for the particular context. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a little bit of how these ideas translate to something that might not be entirely obvious um, in, in immediately. So I'm going to jump a little bit. Um, go here for for a couple more minutes um okay so so how do we translate this now to some some uh, more modern problems uh in particular one problem that i'm very interested in is image processing um which is one of the new kinds of uh data types that we see in 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 kind of big data problems um so, the, so image processing has been uh, is becoming increasingly a very uh, um, effectively a bottleneck in the new kinds of applications we want to create. So, applications that, that do have effect in in, uh, in in our modern life, and because because life kind of seeing is really a huge part of life, uh, the new kinds of AI applications we want to create, they are um, the, one way or the other, they, might, they they will have image processing uh, embedded in them, um, and so. Right now, it's really, really hard uh, and, and slow to uh, to create anything here. And um, and the, effectively, the steps are the same steps that we were discussing before. We're going to store the data, we're going to move the data, we're going to process the data. Uh, and so one way to, to attack this problem is by thinking computationally and thinking about, uh, you know, how can we make processing faster? But again, the same way we've been discussing so far, um, it, the problem actually starts by how we organize, how we store the data. Um, again, not that processing is not is not critical; it's super critical. But unless you get the storage right, um, the data organization right, because of the way hardware works and because of how big the data is, uh, you know the overall problem doesn't really move uh, in terms of improvement that substantially. So. This this is some slides that I, I, I was I was using for a for not, not for a computer science audience so so bear with me for a while but I think they they they, they have their point. Um, so this is a, a typical image analysis task. So locate locate an item a particular item in in this image. So in this case, you know I would ask you to locate the number of horses. Uh, how many horses do you see in this image? And so. Most of us, you know, when we when we look at that image, we can very quickly realize that okay, fine, all of the horses are on the left side of this of this uh, image, and so and there are three of them, great. Um, but if we change the image and we ask again the same question, uh, it's not that you cannot locate the horses and you cannot uh, find how many they are, but it it will just take you more time, right? And uh, how much more time? It depends on on, on how you start searching around, um, but it will take you more time. And so there's still the same information in 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 this in this figure. So there's still three horses, uh, but because they're spread all over the place, it's it's really hard to to uh, very quickly realize what is happening here. Where are the horses? How many we have? And so that brings us back to this problem of of storage. Uh, so we can start thinking. You know, for years about algorithms to navigate that image here, but but if instead we flip the problem around and think about storage, we might have uh, a cleaner, faster way to have a solution. So if we if we think through how do how do machines store data store images today, um, well the answer is primarily JPEG. Uh, so what is JPEG? Uh, JPEG is a first of all it's a standard. Uh, it's uh, what you know. Uh, we have agreed that this makes sense. Uh, we all, you know, have this support in our phones, in our, uh, in, in our, in our laptops, everywhere. So we can move data like this around uh, super, super easily. Um, from a computational perspective, uh, JPEG is a compression mechanism um, because images are have lots of information. 
uh, it's a compression mechanism to help us reduce the size of images. And that makes everything so much easier because we can, now we can move those images faster. We can, we can collect more of those images in the same, in the same space and, and so on and so on and so on. So it has, it, it has, it has wonderful properties. Now, if we go back and think about the context, um, and remember the context is very important because we, 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 we're trying to optimize, ideally if we're looking for performance, we want to optimize for the particular context. Uh, and so the context for, for JPEG, when JPEG was created was that uh, people were, you know, they were sending images, they were creating images, selling images, and they were viewing at those images with their eyes, which makes perfect sense by the way. But, but that, was, that was the context. Um, and so people created JPEG in, in a really brilliant way by saying, okay, uh, you know, what the, the human eye doesn't really see everything. Uh, so the certain frequencies of light and so on and so forth that we don't really see, we don't really perceive um, in, in, in everything in the right, in the same way. So if we start excluding some, some of the data that we don't see now, then we can reduce the amount of data that we actually store and move. Yet, as humans, as we when we see those images, we don't really perceive the difference. Um, and so that this is such a brilliant idea um, and makes makes perfect sense. Uh, but then if we see what happened, what is happening today with the new kinds of, of applications we're trying to create, um, it's not the human eye that that sees those images, uh, but instead it's algorithms. Um, and so if we storing storing images in a way that optimizes for the human eye, while it is algorithms that's, that see those images, it doesn't immediately make good sense. And it, it basically begs the question uh, of, of you know, what other possible ways there are to store those images? Can we do better? In, and so can this help us in terms of moving data more quickly or processing this data more quickly? And so again, what we're trying here to do and what we're creating is, is the space of possible ways to store images. And we we'll figure out that like with data structures and, and, and data systems, uh, classical data systems before, there's more than more more ways that we can think of effectively of how we could we could store images. And so again, we have a massive design space. Um, JPEG happens to be just just one of the points there. And what we want to do is to be able to point to the perfect way to store images for a particular problem. Um, and we're this is the same effectively slide from before. I'm just changing, uh, you know, now we're looking for the basic elements of how we store images and depending on the analysis task that we're gonna do, image classification or something else, we can actually create a different way to store images. We, this is something that we're just starting to have some results. So for example, on ImageNet, we're starting to see a 20X speed up. We're doing image classification. Um, uh, and the whole thing here is by, by recognizing what parts effectively what what bits of the of of uh, of the data you want to keep around because those are the bits effectively that can that can affect uh, neural networks in a way that does change its prediction and so that has nothing to do with the, with the human eye but rather with the how we construct neural networks um i think that yeah that was my last slide uh this is uh students that make all, all of that possible um, thank you everybody for listening and I'm, and, I'm, uh, and thank you for staying in and I'm happy to answer any questions. So does anyone in the audience have any questions or on the Zoom as well? So actually, let me start with uh, a question. Uh, so Strato, imagine uh, that uh, uh, I am... Uh, uh, a biologist or uh, an astrophysicist. So I have built uh, an analysis pipeline, and this is built, uh, for example, using Python. And uh, I don't necessarily know anything about uh, uh, data structures. So the question is, uh, uh, for my case, uh, how does all this uh, uh, tra tra translate? So can I... Uh, can I use uh, um, these ideas somehow to uh, to to make my work uh, more efficient, or is this uh, or making my work more efficient is still uh, a problem that uh, a data management person has to solve? Yeah, today, today the way things are, uh, 
if you, if you see how people work in that space is that you will have different teams effectively working on these problems. In, in a university setup, it will be the same people, of course, but, but in industry, it will be different, different, different teams. And that's what we call uh, you know, data engineering, data science, ML engineering. And so they, they become three different teams effectively. Um, the, the, the solution is, uh, or, or at least you know, for, any, for any database person at least, the solution would be what are the right abstractions under which you can actually hide the, um, the computational and, and data movement elements of the problem that should not be of concern to the data scientist. Um, and uh, while they maintain full statistical control of what they're, the, what they're trying to do. Um, so in, in uh, of course, that's a big statement that, that you know, as, as database people, we, we say effectively all the time across different contexts. Um, in, with, with our work we're trying to do specifically uh, when it comes to our statistics or, or neural network work is that we're trying to maintain effectively the, the high level abstractions that, that you will be using anyways. Uh, and then, and then under them, uh, high, basically collapse all all those computational elements. So, for example, if you are uh, if you want to compute uh, certain statistical measures, um, and and we just give you an abstraction that only to compute the statistic without you having to worry about how big the underlying data is, or uh, the fact, or every time when you're doing repeated experiments, um, when you repeat that statistic, you don't have to worry about um, you know, is that was that computed before, right? or is that a new time that is that this is happening? Uh, and instead, the system takes care of that. So that's what we've done, for example, in our in our data canopy work. Uh, or, for example, um, whether you you're computing, you, you're running two or three different algorithms, and they share a lot of the statistical computation. Um, you don't have to worry about. It. So, so maybe you have, for example, you you you're pipelining three algorithms. All of them, they have some notion of uh, computing uh, standard deviation or, or a mean or a sum over your data. These are effectively, uh, you can do all of that in one pass over, over your data without, without having to, um, without, without the data scientists having to know anything about it. All they're doing is that they're declaring their, their statistical, the statistical properties of what they want to do. And then the system realizes that, oh, this is all the same. You know, you ask for a sum, you ask for an average, you ask for a mean, you ask for a standard deviation. Uh, I can just pass once over your data, com compute that thing once, and I just populate the other statistical measures. Uh, so, our if you look at our data canopy paper, uh, it's doing exactly that. And then, as you repeat the experiments and you change small things again, because it, it has it remembers the previous computations, it doesn't it doesn't have to do those things again. Um, and the same thing, same things we're doing on the on the neural network space where. Um, again, as long as you provide the abstraction of, of uh, uh, just 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 train this neural network or just uh, uh, just do inference over this neural network, but don't worry about the underlying performance, uh, then again they don't they don't have to think about all those things. So so this is nothing profound, let's say at, at least for a, for a from a database logic kind of view. Uh, it's all about hiding uh, these abstractions. Uh, uh, hiding behind these abstractions, and then long term, what has to happen um, once the once the the field consolidates more is that you're hiding over over uh, bigger abstractions that uh, that can cover much more much more of the space. So, so please allow me one follow up question. Uh, so, how far are we now uh, in terms of uh, having a solution? that uh, a, a non-expert uh, data analysts uh, can actually use that exploits all these ideas? I mean, do we have all the elements there or what kind of uh, uh, work is still missing in order to realize this vision? I think, I think, user? yeah, I think, I think we're really close, uh, which is also, <laughs> um, uh, I, um, together with some friends, I, we created the startup uh, and uh, we hope that in the next year or, or year and a half, we'll have something that is usable. Um, uh, so I do think, intellectually speaking, we have the elements. And when I say we, I mean I don't. I don't mean by by we. I mean um, the, the the research community. If you look at the work that the research community in databases has done, uh, and and the way people collectively have been pushing the envelope of performance and abstractions. Uh, you take these concepts and you move them into the space, and, and you have uh, you have the abstractions that you need. 
Uh, and then there's there's a there, there's interesting new elements here that have to do with uh, the concept of iteration and experimentation that that is not necessarily there in in, in the SQL world. Um, there's the, the concept of continuous monitoring and continuous improvement of, of what you want to do, especially when you have an in, um, kind of the same discussion in industrial setup. Um, so, and, and again, you need to hide behind abstractions for, for those elements as well. Uh, so from, from where I stand, I think the, the computational and uh, the computational element is, is more or less solved. And it's a, and uh, we're trying to, uh, at least in, in, in our case, we're trying to execute uh, on that, uh, focusing on, on tabular data for now. Thanks a lot. Uh, so are there any other questions? Are there questions uh, from the Zoom audience? Please unmute if you have a question. Uh, yeah, we have a question here. Uh, would you like to, to, to come to, ah, uh, okay, okay. So use your, uh, your microphone. No. Uh, I don't think I can listen. I can't hear you. Uh, hello, Professor. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hi. Okay, great. Hello. So uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Actually, I found your like case in the GPAC uh, on the image storage is very interesting. So my question is that, so when we design a system, so you usually if want to, to make it more specific, so we can get some acceleration in, in, instead of like performance. However, on the other side, we also try to maintain its general generality, right? So for example, when we try to design a system to store the GPIC images, we may also want to it to be visible to people so that experts can check whether the result is good or not. So can you comment on the trade-off between like the generality and the specificity between these trade-offs when we design such kind of systems? Thank you very much. That, that, that's a wonderful question. Uh, that, that's, that's a really very insightful, very, very insightful question. And, um, and, and you, you put the dimension that you know people would want to check, and, and of course, uh, there's another dimension equal here that someone might be uh, they might want to create a different kind of image processing task, image processing model for uh, using the same images, and so uh, there's no there's no there's no freelance in some sense, right? So so if you don't want your your image classification problem to take uh, you know, I don't know, 15 days to train every time. Um, and, and you want, especially when you put in production, you want it to train every, every one day, every two days. So it's, it stays fresh and everything. Then you do want the data representation there that will make that possible. Um, and then when people want to translate and, and, and view images, uh, to, to examine and, and they, because then they have to see them, then you need to have some kind of a, a wrapper to uh, move that image from the uh, from one representation to another representation that is actually viewable by, by by humans, and when you're starting a new problem, you again have to go through the process on, of moving the data in, into that into that new problem, uh, into into the uh, data organization that that fits into that new problem, and then and then you just go the typical I guess computer science trade of where how much work does this cost, how much time and effort does this cost. Uh, how expensive is this task I want to do? Uh, does does it, the overall thing make sense? Um, and in this case, it, it does make sense because we know that uh, going through the process of of training uh, models, for example, in this case, when we talk about images, uh, it, it's 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 not something that we do in a day or two. It's something that takes months and months and months to to do. And so spending you know maybe half a day and and creating all of the, the data in, in some new data format is is not that big of a deal. Um, if you think about that overall overall time that you're gonna spend, you're gonna save. Um, so so it, it's definitely definitely you would you will have to um, keep changing the data in in different ways uh, to solve different problems. 
uh, and and also for this very nice remark of being able to inspect the data, uh, you you have to do that. Yeah, um, I think again if if we if we look through the history of the uh, com com computational fields in general, so I think if you, if you look at operating systems, um, database systems, there's a lot of innovation in uh, uh, in setting computation, setting data movement, setting storage. Uh, and so potentially in the future, as ideas like this stabilize, um, one could, you know, a, a smart PhD student could innovate and say, oh, you know, this, these problems have 70% uh, overlap in terms of the bits that they store. Uh, and so it's the same image. Uh, I don't have to kind of have two copies, but I can have uh, 1.3 copies in some sense. Uh, setting data at the bit level, perhaps. So I, I, th I think problems like this, there's no, A, there's no freelance. Um, B, you're right yet that this has to happen for practical, for practical uh, reasons. Uh, but I also think that um, the community general has, has created the concepts to, to, to work around that uh, in, in some way. And, and, and hopefully it creates ideas for, for everybody to think about. Yeah, thank you very much. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, are there more questions? So I don't see any more questions. So, so uh, let's thank uh, once again uh, uh, Stratos. So this was uh, very interesting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. So we'll definitely look forward to uh, seeing more results uh, from you on uh, this work. Thanks a lot for being with us today. And thanks all for joining via Zoom. Thank you. Bye-bye.